Well, now uh, for something completely different. Uh, you've been hearing about little molecules. Uh, when I hear about little molecules, I think of the football field. And I think of all the little bits of gr grass. And I'm looking for the football to be able to score a goal against Ibrahim Zlatinovic, or whatever his name is. And of course, if I was looking amongst every single one of those grass blades, I would never find the football and never be able to score the goal. So I go macro, and I talk brain. And I'm not macroscopic, I'm mesoscopic. Right? Meso is halfway, it's not a soup. It's halfway between micro and macro. So we're talking about one millimeter in the cube. That's imaging, and that's what I've grown up in. And I'm a doctor, a neurologist. I've done doctoring all my life, but only a little bit. I've done a lot of science to do with imaging of the brain. But today we're going to talk about something different, because out of this experience over about 35 years, I've come across some very difficult problems. The first of this, these is that our methodology as doctors is pretty dead. We started off 150 years ago with a gentleman called Broker, who was French. And he said, oh, look, this man can't speak and he's got this big hole in his head. So structure and function go together. Functions are distributed over the brain. And so the whole of neurology was built on this. And we took symptoms and signs and so on. And we made all our diagnoses on this. And then, and then came the human, brain, came, came the human genome project. Now, the Human Genome Project you've all heard about. So we'll come back to that in just a moment. So what is the Human Brain Project? That started last October. And it's where Europe has taken on and found courage to try and beat the Americans and be first. <laughs> you know, it's the first time we've done this, and it's pretty exciting, and we're certainly going to do it, and the Americans are furious. And it's very good, but... Being Europeans, we live in a spirit of collaboration. And so already, great tentacles are being sent out from the various continents. And we have an American brain project, a Chinese brain project, a Japanese brain project. Even Singapore has a brain project. People are beginning to understand that we're seeing a cultural change, a change from the lone scientist making his discovery, because he understands everything or she understands everything, to groups of people and groups upon groups, in fact, to social science. Not social networking, social science. And we get all the various um, attributes and skills that are necessary in order to tackle big problems. Not little problems where we're very good at finding out the answer but can't relate it to anything else, but big problems. And there are a lot of big problems coming up. So we started in October 2013... And what we're trying to do is understand the human brain. Now, that sounds really nonsensical, but just, just think about it. We know about base pairs. We know about DNA. You know about RNA. Yes, I can see some nods. You know about proteins. Do you know about the distribution of proteins in cells? In specific cells? You see, we're getting stuck. Then we know about memory. We know about consciousness. But in between, what do we know? We know nothing. So we have a machine where we know there are some tires there, and we know there's a steering wheel, but we don't know how it works. And everything we discover, we try to put together higgledy-piggledy, and we have no blueprint. We have no idea how this thing is put together. So that is the main aim of this project, to write the first blueprint at the multiple scales from mini-mini-micro to mini-micro to mini to micro, up through those mesoscopic levels, right up to the macroscopic things, for which you need your whole brain falling in love, remembering you met this person 10 years ago in the street, that sort of thing. So it was one of two projects. The other one is a sort of boring one. This one's very interesting. And it started six months ago. It's got a lot of researchers, a lot of research groups, a lot of partner institutions in a lot of countries. And there are people in countries outside Europe who can't be funded by us, but who fund themselves in order to join in. So we've tried to get the very best people that we need in order to carry out this mission of using modern technology to dramatically improve our understanding of the human brain. Really, a blueprint. A first one will be rough, 
and that will get better and better and better. And we're talking 10, 15, 20 years' time. Because at the moment when we try to understand the sick brain, all we can think of is symptoms and things. What we want to understand is where is the problem and why is it there. And the funding, you know, they talk about a billion, but in fact it's not quite so much, but it's almost there. So here are some things that you need to know. Your generation is going to pay for my pension. Starts next year. Thank you very much. <laughs> Secondly, when I get to about 85, I will become demented. And then I will go into a home, and then you'll look after me as well. So that will double or triple your costs. So you're going to be working for a very, very good cause. Unless someone here works out what's wrong in Alzheimer's disease, in dementia. There are lots of other things. Depression. Masses of people get depressed. You've all been depressed. Boyfriend's gone away. Girlfriend's told you you're very ugly and she doesn't want to see you anymore. Very depressing. But there are serious depressions. Black holes which make you take your life. That's a serious disease because it's young people then. There are cerebrovascular accidents, Parkinson's. There are lots and lots of diseases about we, which we know very little and we treat the symptoms of and we want to get at the causes. Why should we do it in Europe? Well, the first thing is we are bloody strong. Sorry, that's a naughty English word. We are very strong in neuroscience. Very, very strong in neuroscience. Look, there are even people here who are strong in neuroscience in this very room. And these people have all contributed to neuroscience, some things which we don't even recognize as neuroscience. You know, how bees come together and things like that. How people make decisions. And uh, the bases, the molecular bases as well, of course. A lot of these people are still alive. Some, of course, are not. All these names, I'm sure, you recognize. There's a lot of them. That's why we should be doing this in Europe. So... What is the problem? The problem is that we are generating vast amounts of data. So this is a graph of time, start 1990, finish 2012. This is the number in thousands, up to 120,000 of papers published on neuroscience per annum. Just look at it. Exponential. And when you go into your examinations, your examiners expect you to know all of this. It's stupid really, isn't it? So you should tell them, look, I don't know anything about what you're asking me, but what I do know about is this, and I'd be very happy to tell you about it. And that will win you points. I can, I, can, I can guarantee it. And then we have all the scales from the brain itself, 1.4 kilograms of porridge. When you take it out of the skull, if you haven't fixed it, it has the consistency of porridge. You'll know what porridge is. Yeah, you're not Scottish. No, that's all right. So 1.4 kilograms of porridge, 1.35 for ladies on average, and all the way up to some of the little molecules that we were talking about today, going through ion channels, coming out of synaptosomes, all these levels we need to have an understanding. So what do we lack? Well, we have no way of integrating all this information. We don't know how to curate the data. More and more we see people retracting papers, but what about all those that we haven't retracted? What do we know is right? What do we know is not right? No plan to link across these levels. Someone working at DNA level never knows anything about what's happening at the cognitive level, unless you know, he reads Time magazine and looks at pictures of brain scans. No plan to transfer knowledge from the animal model, which we all use, the mice. You know, some of us have mouse brains, but a lot of us have bigger brains than that. You know, transferring that knowledge is very important. And no plan to go beyond just symptom-based classifications of disease. So our knowledge is fragmented, and this is a very big problem that we have. Because this is the most exciting area of science, neuroscience, because this is the science that is producing the problems that we have to face. So we started off with the Human Brain Project to say, enough of all this data, let's just use the data we've got. So there are about somewhere between, the estimate is between three and eight million papers. If you put in the right mesh words into the National Library of Science on your Macs, you'll find. Over the years, 19, 35 years, neuroscience has been a discipline. So what we think about the Human Brain Project is that it's not going to 
upset lots of neuroscientists who are generating data in their little specific projects which are extremely clear, extremely hypothesis-led, extremely well done. We're going to use that already exists and we're going to try and federate it and integrate it. And you might think, what the hell does this guy mean? And what I mean is this, that in 15 years we have seen an explosion in something called information technology. And each one of you is probably better at it than I am, and certainly much better at it than this front row. We all use so-called von Neumann machines, which are digital, binary, right? And we all know this Moore's law, which suggests that, you know, the power of computers is going up exponentially per year, but suddenly the computing industry is telling us, whoa, we've reached a brick wall. Rather like we in neurology have reached a brick wall with our symptoms and signs, they've reached the brick wall that you need so much energy to run these big supercomputers. You know what a supercomputer is? It's the size of six football fields. Do you know how much energy it consumes? It could probably light up and heat half, if not the whole, of Stockholm. The one outside Lausanne does heat the whole of four, a considerable part of Lausanne. Do you know how fast they work? The best supercomputers work at about 10 to the 15 or 10 to the 16 calculations per second. The estimate for federating and integrating all this data in order to get the first blueprint of the human brain is about 10 to the 18 calculations per second, which is exascale. IBM are telling us in 2018 they will have an exascale computer. So we'll be able to do this. So, whoopsie. So we want to go eventually beyond exascale. So the computing guys are telling us we've got to move from these sorts of machines to machines that have a different architecture. And what really interests them is how this machine works. Now, I presume all of you are materialists. So you all believe that a machine that occupies six football fields and this 1.4 kilograms are made of the same matter and therefore subject to the same laws of chemistry and physics. So how come this is, in its way, extremely inventive and innovative, whereas this big machine, which is also doing lots of calculations, is not? What is the problem? Where are the architectural changes and differences that might lead us to progress from the von Neumann machine to something that was more based on brain architecture? Now, the really important things, however, are these. The internet, massive increases in speeds and um, amounts of data that are being taken across. Database management, you all know this company. Cloud environments, who uses Dropbox here? Raise your hand. Okay, put them down. Who uses Amazon to buy their books? A ah, fewer, put your hand down. Who used Dropbox three years ago? Raise your hands. Very many fewer. Very many. Five years ago? No, you didn't. It wasn't there yet. <laughs> but he's Italian. Nobody can forgive him. <laughs> he probably pays his taxes as well. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so. It's all right. It's all right. I believe you. <laughs> but what about this, guys? Eh? Google. You all use Google. Right? $100 billion worth in 10 to 15 years. Not bad. Real-time visualization and usage by people like us of supercomputers, which currently there are all sorts of difficulties, how to use them and so on. All these things mean that we are now in a position to do this federation and subsequent integration. So let's just go through this. Syndromic diagnosis, which we want to go to some sort of mechanistic or causal diagnosis, which will allow us to define patient populations more clearly and allow us to do what we were hearing about, change a bit of dopamine here, dabble a bit with the 5-HT receptor there, perhaps do them together in order to bring about a change in the neurochemical or some other milieu within which the brain is working. What has happened? First, we've had the human... Well, sorry, I'm going to uh, go back one. So let's talk about syndromic diagnosis. It's reached its limits. You all know this gentleman here. Yes? Who doesn't know this gentleman? Who 
doesn't know that he was demented for the last four years of his presidency. One person, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And that's not because people thought he was a bad politician. He was simply, if you listen to his speeches, he's repetitive. He doesn't use the words in the right way. He's prompted. Sometimes he makes no sense. He was clinically demented, but he was able to run a country extremely effectively. Perhaps you don't agree with what he did, but he was able to run it very effectively. Because he had a lot of help around him and people who could understand him from his past. What we usually do when we diagnose dementia is talk to not the patient, because the patient's demented and they often don't know that there's something wrong. They come in and you say to them, what's wrong with you? I don't know. Are you okay? Yes. Why are you here? She told me to come or he told me to come. So then you start talking to a relative or a nurse. So all these stories come sort of second, third, fourth hand. You put them all together and you say, ah, this is dementia. And then you say, it's Alzheimer's disease. But the relationship between the disease, which is the mechanisms that cause the syndrome, which is the dementia, is unknown. Do you know how good we are at diagnosing Alzheimer's disease when proven post-mortem? Who thinks we're 50% correct? 60? 70? Yeah, tested post-mortem. Diagnosis tested post-mortem. 70? 80? 90? 60%. 60%. Massive study from the NIH last year. Tom Beach. So we say this patient has, has Alzheimer's disease. We're wrong. 40% of the time. Then we go to a pharmacologist and we say, why don't you find a drug to treat Alzheimer's disease? Or better still, a drug to teach Treat dementia. Well, there are lots of causes of dementia, and you heard even pugilists cause dementia to each other by hitting each other in, in the brain. But let's just take Alzheimer's disease. So let's have a clinical trial. We've got a good drug here. We'll have some Alzheimer's disease patients. Well, the error variance there is 40%. So let's take some normal people to contrast well, we also know that the brain is a very redundant organ. What does that mean? It has many ways of doing things. So it can compensate very well. We were hearing about Parkinson's disease earlier today. You need to lose 70% of the nigrostriatal cells, a very small population of cells, about a million on each side. 70% to get the first symptom. So that just shows you how much capacity to compensate there is. So there are lots of people going around, also pro them pathologically, who have the changes of Alzheimer's disease post-mortem but were never abnormal cognitively, or not, at least not in the way we test them. So you've got an error variance of, say, 20 or 30% there. Now you're asking the drug company to test whether the drug makes a difference. It just makes no sense at all. So we need to go further than that. Human Genome, Human Genome Project did lots of things. Showed us how few genes we have on the one hand, but it hasn't unlocked the causes of diseases the way we thought because so many diseases are multigenic. Okay? But what we can do is again go to the, on your Mac you could do this, go to the Public Library of Science in Washington or the NIH in Bethesda I mean, and put in all the diseases out of the manual of diagnost diagnostic manual of diseases. Right? And then put in all the genes that are known, 30,000, and just say, create me a multidimensional picture of how these things associate with each other. And this is just in two dimensions, but it's a very, very multidimensional space. This was done in half a day by one postdoc. Okay? And there are clearly lots of associations. There's structure in this. This is not just randomness. So that's a very important lesson. Modern neuroimaging, the sort of thing I do, has also been extremely helpful because it's allowed us for the first time to look into this box here at normal brains. Now, you might say, well, a neurosurgeon opens up the skull, but I've just told you how the brain is very, very able to exhibit this thing, plasticity, we were talking about in the previous lecture, and to compensate for damage. In fact, your brains are so plastic that with every word I say, your brain is changing. Every single one. Even if you're asleep, and, but you're perceiving something, but asleep, you know, subconscious perception, if you like.
We've done experiments where we got people to do this and then do nothing and then do it a second time and then do it a third time. Their brains change the second time, third time. They're learning. Plasticity. Our brains are extremely plastic. So modern neuroimaging has allowed us to go into the normal brain without opening up the skull. And that's been absolutely remarkable. For example, I'll give you two little examples. These are the brains. You, you can see this is sort of looking on them as though it was a boiled egg. This is looking from the side of the boiled egg. This is looking from the front of the boiled egg. This is the Huntington's disease you already heard about. One gene. People don't get the disease until 30, 40, 50 years into life. You can get nice normal people who don't have the Huntington gene and in the same family, nice normal people who do have the Huntington gene who will definitely get the disease later on. Compare their brains. They're all normal. In yellow, you could see loss of blood, brain tissue, called this atrophy. So we can see already in the preclinical state, we could see a very specific distribution of brain loss. It's in those places where post-mortem will find the biggest damage. Okay, so that's one thing we could do. The second thing we could do is with one brain scan and using novel techniques, which are computerized for analyzing the images, which have, you know, 100,000 bits which constitute these images. So you know, the brain can't do it on its own. It needs a computer. These, these techniques are called, are called machine learning techniques, and this is one particular one. We could go from the standard 80 or less percent correct classification by a radiologist with a terrible sensitivity and some specificity. With a single image, we can get up to this sort of level. So there are things that we could do which are not being taken up for the moment, and it's not entirely clear why, but radiologists like to use their experience to make diagnoses, but they should be learning informatics as well. And this is you know, one of the problems with having silos, departmental silos, is that people do not interact with each other sufficiently. So if you do anything in your scientific lives, Always go and see the department next door. Never sit in your department. And if your department boss tells you you're not allowed to, ignore him. <coughs> so, that's, now we come to modern neuroscience. Well, as we've said, enormous advances in little pieces of knowledge about neuroscience in different animals at different scales. The real problem is how do we bring all this together? Look at the... Look at the fantastic tools we now have. This is a rat brain which is being morphed evolutionarily into a human brain. So that's some hundreds of thousands of years all in one little movie. Here's the uh, fibers that link up the different parts of the brain, which is very difficult to discover post-mortem. Much easier to find them in life in those images. Here's a wonderful new technique. You put the brains in a special oil and then shine a monochromatic light through it. This is a rat brain. Look, you can see all the little pyramidal cells and all their connections down into the base of the brain. These are absolutely fantastic techniques. The real issue is how do we bring these bits of information together? And we need to start from the molecules up through the neurons, synapses, what we think are microcircuits. We believe there are some bigger circuits. We think they're big circuits. We don't really know. I mean, for the moment, we're talking about mirror neurons. Well, if you have a big circuit and one bit of it is firing, then another bit of it will fire as well if it's a mirror neuron, if, if it's a circuit. So, so a lot of interest in mirror neurons at the moment. Not entirely clear why. Whole brain, these are the columns, the little columns that's, that constitute the cortex, and then finally cognition. And these are just some of the disciplines that will be required to discover unifying models that unify across these scales from data and from previous knowledge. We've talked about the explosive development in information technology. One other thing that it has led to is to make one interested in mathematics again. You know how mathematics is boring because it's all those symbols and it's in Greek as well. And sometimes they put in a bit of Russian, I think. But you never quite know because it's all very squiggly. Modern mathematics, 
Modern mathematics has computing power which allows mathematicians to test their new theories very much more quickly than they used to be able to when they had to calculate. And there's a lot of, there's a real explosion in modern mathematics, particularly in statistics, which is the most boring part of mathematics, and where even we at our age are stick, stuck with p values and univariate analyses. Where I've just shown you that the world is multivariate, it's not linear, it's non-linear, and where you really need the power of computers in order to be able to solve the magnificent equations that mathematicians are coming up with. So, we use these computers, we use this mathematics, we use the data that are available to simulate the brain. So instead of getting a hypothesis, describing it in mathematics, putting in the data, finding the results, fiddling with it, that means optimizing the model, getting the right result and saying, here's a model of memory. Right? Instead of doing that, we're saying, well, we want to see how the DNA produces the RNA, produces this, produces that, produces that, the proteins, produces the synapses. We want to build bottom up. And that is not hypothesis-led, it's hypothesis-generating. So there's a shift in this approach from top-down hypothesis-led research to bottom-up hypothesis-generating research. And it's very difficult to do because granting agencies don't like it. You have to have a hypothesis for a granting agency. And this is why we had to go to the informaticians, because the money that's come from this, much to our shame, has not come from neuroscience or medicine or research. It's come from informatics, all of it. And that is really quite remarkable. And I think one of the most interesting things culturally about this whole process that's gone on. So, this is what we're going to use to model the brain. You might think, well, this is crazy. This is an idea which has infinite degrees of freedom. It's impossible. So, if anyone says that to you, just say, oh, I see, it's infinite degrees of freedom. How many base pairs are there in a living organism? <laughs> degrees of freedom. Okay. Then, how many genes are there? 30,000. Then, uh, how many types of neurons are there? There are about 40, 50. How many different electrical, morphological types of neurons are there? 256, roughly, at the moment. Right? So, actually, each level of organization predicts what the next can be and eliminates lots of those it could not be if the level of organization is correct. So far from being an infinite degrees of freedom problem, it becomes a simpler and simpler problem. And this makes someone like me understand finally a great paradox in my own professional life, which is that I got people to do things like reading or navigating in space or whatever, the sorts of things that Bengt was talking about, and I would find three or four areas interacting with each other in the brain. And I think to myself, something as complex as that, just three to four areas, how can that be? Because the organization of the brain only permits that. So, uh, just to show you that you all know what this is about, here's one rule which will go into the model. That's the Hodgkin-Huxley equation. You remember the one that tells you how the, uh, the, the impulse travels down the myelinated fiber very fast, going from internode to internode? There are lots of such equations now beginning to describe the various levels of organization. And then you really get the computer and algorithms to simulate these models. You use knowledge such as what is the proportion of this cell and that cell in this layer and that layer. What's the probability of this cell combining with that cell, this cell in this layer combining with that cell in that layer. We know all of that. Anatomists have been bringing together all that sort of information for many years. What's the density of veins? What's the density of arteries in the different layers of the cortex? So we've got to the stage now where, bar the glial cells, we have constructed, my colleague Henry Markram and his group have constructed a model of one barrel of the mouse cortex. And they've tested it in vivo, and they've done the experiment in silico on the model, and they find a correspondence always within 90% of the outputs, with no twisting and tweaking and so on. So this is proof of principle, which is an extremely important proof of principle. We're able now to simulate the column, 
I mean, these are lovely movies, but it sort of gives you an idea of what, what one can do. And the other thing one can't do is always get the Mac to work fast enough. We've now put, or they've now put, a number of these columns together and have injected electrical impulse and are able to show how the waves of activity travel through the various columns. So the next question is, how many of these columns will we be able to put together? And using the supercomputers, the idea is that we'll be able to define, at least in something that approaches a mouse brain, a level of organization which comes up to the macro in the first instance, then moving straight using those principles and methods into the human brain after the first five years of work. And then the final <coughs> um, limit, of course, what we will use is the, math is the mathematical computerized model, put in inputs, and through these processes get outputs, which could be then tested in a virtual reality environment with avatars or other things, before being produced as machines or robots or, 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 or things which, which can help uh, disabled people or which can build better cars and so on and so on. So generally, we're, we're, we're moving in the direction of neural computation being a chain of events, a causal chain of events that leads to some form of cognitive activity. So finally, we've reached medicine. And now the question is, can we get this mechanistic diagnosis? Can we move from clinical features and blood tests and imaging and cerebrospinal fluid tests, amyloid, all these things, which is what our biologists do in the hospitals. This is what our doctors do in the hospitals. Can we find a space here where we get sets of rules which define homogeneous groups of people with disease of the brain? And these sets of rules will be variables, each of them parameterized. They could be epidemiological. They could say something about the nerve cells. They could say something about the neurochemistry. They could say something about the degree of atrophy and so on, so that we can both explain and predict what is going to happen in the sample space and the, and, and, the, uh, and, and the disease space. What we plan to do is to set up essentially a Googleization of hospital databases and research databases. But it's Google Plus. You know that if you go into Google, you have at your fingertips the results of a particular question that you pose from all over the world. And if you go through sufficient pages, you will have all the information there. What we want to do is to put one of these things in. We call it an infrastructure. It won't be a computer. Well, it'll be a computer, but not like this. In each of the databases. And we have our computer experts at the EPFL in Lausanne have invented a technique where they can distribute a query to all these computer databases. They can find the relevant information locally. They can anonymize it aggregate it, bring it together into a federated space. And then we can start integrating it and start posing questions. There are two sorts of things we'll be doing. We'll be, as more and more hospitals join, our data mining servers will be creating the disease space, creating disease signatures. A signature defines a homogenous group of patients with, with identical rules. And at the same time, we'll have doctors, and we'll have researchers who will be asking questions of this enormous disease space and all, these, all this information that is sitting in all sorts of data stores all around the world. There'll be federation nodes, the query engine, the metadata will be known, everything that in principle this does, but more in that it will be bringing back anonymized private data in a way that it can't be found subsequently. So, have we done this? Yes, we've done it once. We've taken a lot of aged people, some of them ill, some of them are not ill. We've had scans in some of them, both PET and MRI. We've had a lot of clinical scales and measurements, validated scales and measurements. SNPs in some of them, from 500,000 to others, a million SNPs, some none. We've had cerebrospinal fluid from some of them. We've had proteins in the blood and the cerebrospinal fluid, things like amyloid tau and so on. And we've put all this together, organized it in an Excel table, would you believe? But you need something a little more sophisticated in the final analysis. And then we've put it th through one of these data mining architectures. I won't go through this. It's too complicated for today. But essentially, it allows you to go from the data source 
and look for sets of rules which define groups of subjects, groups of patients who were very similar. And the question is, what do we get? Well, if you look at the red and the blue dots, the red and the blue dots, these are normal people and these are, out, these are demented people. And the first extraordinary finding was that there were a number of demented people. But as soon as we thought about it, we realized it was not extraordinary because there are lots of different things that could cause dementia. One of them, this big one, is associated with APOE4, which is one of the genes that gives the highest 20% risk factor if you're homozygous for it. It's associated with the A-beta uh, amyloid protein and its gene. So it looks as though this is going to turn out to be Alzheimer's disease. Why are there many blue ones? Well, some of them are compensating. Some of them are completely normal. Some of them may be super normal. We were hearing about people who are particularly smart and uh, have been inventive and innovative all their lives. Perhaps there's something different in their brains. And if we look at this, we could see that the various genetic and protein groups sit around and are associated with limited sets of these. And further, that the image data seems to preferentially go to different... So it, atrophy here in the temporal lobes and the parietal lobes sits around that big Alzheimer's disease, let's call it Alzheimer's disease today, around this big one here. Now, this is a small group of subjects. When we talk about data mining, we're talking about a million, two million. Yesterday, I was on the phone to my friend at UCLA, who... Who's a, who's a deputy chancellor there, and he told me they've just put the University of California system, of which there are, just remind me, seven or eight universities, I think, all their patient databases together. 16 million patients can be assessed and examined by their researchers. So this thing is moving extremely fast, and of course they're very excited about joining the Human Brain Project. The final thing I want to tell you about the Human Brain Project is that I've been talking to you mostly about future medicine, which seeks to classify data, federate and integrate it. I talked to you at the beginning a little bit about future computing, which seeks to produce new computers, new computer architectures, new robots and similar things, and future neuroscience, which seeks to unify all the information that we currently have to produce a unifying blueprint or model or whatever you like, which is a set of equations which could be placed in a supercomputer through which people could generate new hypotheses and which could be used to test new hypotheses. The project is at its ramp-up phase. It's producing the infrastructure. There are six different platforms. They're designed to be open to new partners from the start. There's going to be a lot of the money will be for open competitive science, but within a non-competitive, collaborative, multidisciplinary environment. And that's proving quite difficult to do because some of our best scientists are so competitive that they're finding it difficult to collaborate. And that collaboration, nevertheless, is absolutely crucial to this sort of science. And we hope very much that this will be you, a new generation of multidisciplinary scientists, clinicians and engineers People who are really good at the thing they do, but even better at talking to someone who does something else also as well. And of course, in the final analysis, this could change many things that we do in our life in the same way as computers have changed our lives over the last 20 years. So we've got people monitoring, monitoring ethics, forecasting ethical challenges, and discussing these with the public. And we're also exploring European wealth creation creating new industries and new jobs, which critical, will be critical for you and critical also for us pensioners who you will be supporting. Thank you very much. Thank you.